Well, good evening, brethren. Uh, yeah, we are on our 27th study on the book of Revelation. And uh, the Apostle John described a number of events uh, in the book of Revelation as it was revealed to him through, uh, by Christ. And uh, he particularly spends, spends quite a bit of time discussing events during the day of the Lord, which is the period of the seven trumpets and uh, includes also uh, particularly the last trumpet, which is the, the key events uh, during Christ's return, the period of Christ's return. There are a number of important events that happen during that period. Um, uh, then he describes seven lost plagues, which are some a number of uh, plagues which illustrate the utter destruction of Satan's kingdom and rule on earth by Christ. So one of the things that Christ does is utterly destroy Satan's kingdom and rule on earth. And in last study, we began to describe the details about the, that destruction, but particularly the side of Satan's religious system. So obviously he did not just destroy the religious system. So in Revelation 17, that's what we did when we covered Revelation 17. We saw the destruction of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, as we read in Revelation 17 verse 5, uh, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth, uh, which, you know, which is the woman which uh, uh, martyred many saints uh, and uh, witnesses of Jesus Christ. That's what uh, this false church has done or inspired through this false religion, this false Babylonian system that is inspired by Satan. We then also uh, went through the detailed section of verse 7 through 12 of Revelation 17, which identifies the woman and the beast. Now today, what we want to do, uh, we want to review that identification because uh, we're going to see in greater detail the fall of Babylon the Great uh, from Revelation 17 until its complete destruction at the end of Revelation 18. So Revelation 17 and 18, in a sense, are, are about one thing, which is the destruction and the fall of Babylon, uh, which is Babylon the Great. So, uh, this destruction of the city of the Great Olet, which is first religious Babylon. Uh, that's what we covered in uh, Revelation 17. And which is the woman that, as I mentioned, drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And, and the, uh, uh, the Apostle John says, I saw her in the vision and he marveled with great amazement. As we know, this church, this uh, religious system is actively, has been and will be actively involved in the persecution of two Christians. Um, it, uh, today, it is, uh, in a sense, uh, very subtle, but uh, I was involved in the counseling of a man which was interested in the church, uh, and uh, and he was a priest of this uh, Catholic Church, and he was saying how he was really persecuted because of his desires to keep the Sabbath and uh, his belief that Trinity was not true according to the Bible. So he was starting to believe that, to understand that, and he was showing to me how vicious 
the persecution to him was because particularly he was or had been a a priest so uh, we are not yet just talking about babylon of old but of the apostate christian churches of today that uh, are following the wrong uh, beliefs basically uh, inspired by satan which are uh, being founded or been running or been uh, uh, being executed in the world through old babylon which is now uh, a, let's call it a revived babylon so we also made mention in revelation 17 3 that this woman was sitting on a beast on a scarlet beast which was full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns so it is important to understand who is the woman and who is this beast that the woman is sitting on i also made reference and I mentioned that this beast that the woman is sitting on is highlighted in Revelation 13 from verse 1 through verse 10, which is the beast that comes out of the sea, which talks about it, seven heads and ten horns. But then in Revelation 13 verse 11, through 18 talks about a second beast which is a beast from earth or from the earth uh, which talks like a lamb which is basically represented here in revelation 17 as the woman so the second beast of revelation 13 starting in verse 11 is the woman in revelation 17 so let's review all this very clearly so we understand. It's material we've covered before, but it is important that we review it to clearly understand. What do we have? Starting in Daniel 2, we have an image, the head of gold, the breast and arms of silver, and the belly and thighs of brass in Daniel 2. That is the image of uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And that is paralleled with Daniel 7 because the first beast is a lion, uh, or like a lion, let's rather say that. The second beast like a bear. The third beast like a leopard, which has four heads. We also explained that those four heads represent the four divisions of Greece after uh, uh, Alexander the Great. So it had these four heads or these four divisions. So really what are we talking about? The total number of heads, we see uh, this first beast, one head, a prophetic Babylon, because this is Babylon. The head is Babylon, it's the Chaldean Empire. Then the second beast is a bear, which represents a second head of prophetic Babylon, which is the Persian Empire. Then we had the third beast, like a leopard, with four heads. So yeah, we got four heads. Four plus one and plus another one makes six heads in total. And then we have the fourth beast, strong like a lion, with ten horns. And this fourth beast represents, therefore, the seventh head of prophetic Babylon. And this Babylon, this beast, this beast, this prophetic Babylon, has a deadly wound. This is what is referred to, and I'll make a mention of a little later, is the beast that was. The beast that was because it was and went into a bottomless pit 
it had a deadly wound. Then this beast, however, this fourth beast, has a number of horns that continue. And as we see, it has got 10 horns. Uh, the first three horns are the Vandals, the Ruli, and Ostrogoths. And these three horns are no other than uh, uh, groups of people that followed what we call today Arianism, right? Uh, Arian kingdoms. Basically what it means is that kingdoms that believed religious kingdoms, so again follows this Babylonian concept, but religious kingdoms that believed that Christ was an angel, Michael. So uh, they, uh, they believed that Christ was, was, uh, was an angel. Uh, I can't remember now whether it's Michael or Gabriel, I stand to be correct today. But they believed that Christ was an angel. Then there was another horn that came up that spoke a little horn among those 10 in Daniel 7. It's a two-horned lamb dragon in uh, uh, Daniel, I'll be part of it, in uh, Revelation uh, 13. In Revelation 13, it's this two-horned lamb, uh, lamb dragon image. So it's the second beast of Revelation 13. As I mentioned, it starts from 11 through 18, that is equated to the scarlet woman of Revelation 17 that rode the beast. Right? So this represents false Christianity, which has an image of the Roman Empire, the image of the beast, because the beast is the Roman Empire. So what do we have? is uh, an important analogy by looking at these charts. So let me go back. When we look at these charts, it is important that we understand that they all are telling a story and with time is creating an additional layer or depth of understanding to the original uh, revelation, which is the image of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel 2. So all of these are just adding extra details to that. So what do we have here is a couple of interesting things. In the first place, the Bible talks about 1260, right? So the persecution of the church for 1260 years started in AD 325 for 1260 years till 1585, which was the uh, basically the Protestant Reformation and that period when uh, religion started uh, being not so controlled or dominated by the Catholic Church. Right? Um, then there is another side of the 1260 years, which is civil, which started in AD 454, when there was the, the civil governments that came along, which we'll look at in a moment. So, this is important to understand that Daniel 2 forms the basis. Daniel 2 says that the head, you are king, you are the king of kings. And the God of heaven has given you a kingdom of power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand. He has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So this Babylonian empire 
the Chaldean Empire, is the head, and from it flows the rest of the body. You see, this is a very important key, because if we want to follow prophecy all the way till the ten toes, they are part of this statue. So it has, be, has to be part of a continuity that has occurred. So this is important to understand. Some people don't understand prophecy because they don't see this continuity of this image all the way from head to toe. That is an important clue to understand it. So Babylon represents the head. This is the political, financial, and religious system which basically continues today to this modern day. And therefore it has a lasting impact like gold. So it is a system. Okay, it's technology is modernized, but this, the concept is basically the same. And then it says, uh, mentions, uh, and we'll come to this later on in Revelation 18, that talks about this mighty city, over it the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn, and they've done businesses even in souls of men. So this system has basically migrated or evolved from kingdom to kingdom, from Babylon itself to the Medes and Persians, to, like, to Greece, to Rome, but it's the same system. There's a continuity there from one to another through to modern day Rome. So the spirit of this system has been the fuel for European growth over the centuries. And over the centuries, millions of people have died in Europe because of this system, which has persisted and persists until today and will soon be resurrected, will come out of this bottomless pit. So this image of Daniel 2 helps us to identify the king of the north and the beast and all, uh, power in today's world scene. It helps to identify who these nations are. Now, as we saw, Daniel 2 is directly related to Daniel 7 because lion represents the head of gold. The, the bear represents the chest and the arms of silver. The leopard represents the belly or, and the thighs of bronze of the image. And as I said, the leopard has four heads, a total of six heads. And then the fourth is a terrible beast, which is the seventh head, strong as iron. So this beast then has ten horns, which represents there will be ten resurrections because it has a deadly wound. So there will be different resurrections. A beast with seven heads and ten horns of Revelation 13 is directly related to Daniel 7. Why? Because the seven heads are these seven heads and the ten horns are these ten horns that continue down here. So Revelation 13 and Revelation 7 are directly related. Okay. This beast suffered a mortal wound. Revelation 13, 3. Right? And represents the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 AD. Specifically, the western part of the empire. Why? Because the eastern part continued. So it did not have the deadly wound. So it really is talking here about the western leg of the Roman Empire. So 
as we look now at that little horn of Daniel 7, verse 8, and verse 24 and 25, that represents a false church, uh, the mother of harlots of Revelation 17, verse 5. That's the this little horn, yeah, in, Revel, in Daniel 7, represents the scarlet woman who rode the beast. But not consider. He did not ride that beast up there uh, with its seven heads because it had a deadly wound. But it rode the resurrected portion of the beast, which are these other seven horns to follow. The first through the first three were plucked out. You remember they were plucked out. Where they were destroyed at the behest of the Pope, uh, and uh, uh, and that is in a book called Transition Age. So the woman, therefore, appears in the scene. The woman appears in the scene after pluck, plucking out the first three horns, which are the alien kingdoms. Because the alien kingdoms, they were religious based kingdoms that believed that Christ was an angel. So, and this horn that comes on afterwards is believes in the Trinity. And so what do we have? We had a fight between the, 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 the incorrect idea of Christ being an angel and the incorrect idea of the Trinity and the idea of the Trinity one. So that's where these uh, uh, three horns were pulled out. And that's why this woman only rides the beast from this moment on. This is also very important. Explains therefore why the woman of Revelation 17 only rides the beast from this moment onwards. Now, continuing down here, this woman, scarlet woman of Revelation 17, now rides the beast with seven heads and ten horns. What are these seven heads and ten horns? The first head correlates with the fourth horn here of Daniel 7 because this is the first of the remaining seven horns of Revelation 13. Remember those first three were plucked out so there's only seven left out now. So this is the first of the remaining seven horns because the deadly wound had been healed, right? And it was to continue for 1260 years. This is the 1260 years of this civil government from 554 till uh, uh, 1814. Uh, 102. 1,260 years exactly. So, this uh, fourth horn, which is the first of the remaining seven year of Revelation 13, now, in this beast that is written by, written by the woman, because the previous beast went, uh, had a deadly wound, so this new uh, beast, this new beast now uh, has these seven heads, which correlate with the remaining seven horns. So this is the first head of the beast that was healed, ridden by the scarlet woman. And that is what's called 
the imperial restoration of the empire by Justinian, which started in 554. He recognized the supremacy of the Pope, submitted, it submitted to him. Again, this is the western part of the Roman Empire. Then, so the Catholic Church, this church, this woman only rode the western leg of this empire. It never rode the eastern leg. So then the second head ridden by the woman is the Frankish kingdom, which began in 774 by Charlemagne the Great. And then the third head is the so-called the Holy Roman Empire by the German head Otto the Great. So you can see its western side of this Roman Empire because that's the part that had a deadly wound. And then we have the fourth head, which was uh, an Austrian head, uh, Charles the Great. Uh, it's the Habsburg dynasty. And the fifth head was Napoleon's kingdom, the French head, crowned also by the Pope till 1814. Those are the 1260 years. So in 1814, just 1260 years after the deadly wound was healed, the Holy Roman Empire was dissolved. So closed a government that dated from Augustus Caesar. But remember, this beast that was will come, come back again. In the meantime, we have a, a, a section of the scripture in Revelation 17, verse 10, which talks about the, the heads, there's the five that, that were, one that is, and one is yet to come. One that is, obviously, it clearly means that is for a specific time, because the, this also means that these five that were, one at ease and another is yet to come. It means they're not contemporary. It means they, they don't happen at the same time. It means one happens, then the other one happens, then the other one happens, and so on. They're not contemporary. And, and that's important to understand. And because some people think, how oh, well, they're contemporary. No, they're not. So that shows one is yet to come. And that one yet to come, when is this dated? It's dated, and that's why I have the little asterisk here, the little asterisk there, is dated when this scripture was understood during the period around about the end of the Second World War, which was understood by Mr. Armstrong. At that time, then, that was exactly when it was understood and that uh, related to uh, Italy and Germany and, uh, and uh, Mussolini and all that sort of time frame of the Second World War and, uh, and that, that period. Then one is yet to come, which is still future. We haven't seen this. This is what is to come, is the seventh head and ten horns of Revelation 17. Right, which is this beast that ascends out of the pit. Why? Because this beast had a deadly wound, which is the one all the way up there, which was the, the time of the Roman Empire. And that's why then we have represents the ten toes, which is this one yet to come which correlates to these 10 horns of Revelation 17. Now understand this represents uh, the western leg of the Roman Empire, but the statue does have two legs. Yes, because the western leg of the Roman Empire does have what we call today Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And 
a lot of what we call today Eastern Europe uh, was and is under the influence of this woman, the Catholic Church. So that explains the importance of building everything up from Daniel 2 with Daniel 7 with Revelation 13 and 17, putting it all together <coughs> because then we start understanding who this beast is that the scarlet woman rode. So we, we covered this a little earlier. Uh, we went through that. So to continue that in Revelation 17 verse 7, and this again is a formal review of what we covered uh, in the previous lesson, but I believed I needed to go through it again to actually put the jigsaw puzzle very clearly. In, in verse 7, it says, well, let me tell you the ministry of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Well, the beast that you saw was and is not, and will ascend out of the bottomless pit. So it is a beast that came from the Roman Empire that is not, but the woman is riding it. Uh, but that beast out of the Roman Empire will ascend out of the bottomless pit. Also, it talks in Revelation 17, verse 9, and it says, uh, Yah is a bit of the mind, that it says, uh, they are seven mountains. A mountain is an analogy to governments. So it's seven governments, seven heads there of governments. Five have fallen, one is, and the other is yet to come. I showed you that in the graph a little moment ago. Again, as I said, this proves they're not contemporary. The one that has not yet come only lasts for a short period of time. And then I went through in a lot more detail in Bible study number 22. So if you want to go back to it and review it, you're welcome. Then in verse 11 it says, the beast that was and is not, he is himself also the eighth, and he's of the seven, and he's going to perdition. What do you mean by that? He's of these seven that the woman rides, but is the one that will ascend out of the bottomless pit, which is the basic old Roman Empire. And so this final uh, resurrection, it will be far more vicious because it will have that Roman Empire characteristics. And so is also the eighth and is of the seven and is going to perdition because when Christ comes, it will destroy it completely. And that's a little bit more of what we are going to see today. However, in verse 12, it says, The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. Right? But they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. So these ten horns are contemporary. That's the ten, the revival of ten nations, probably five from Western Europe five from Eastern Europe, representing the two legs, but that is, as I mentioned, part of the Western side of the Roman Empire, not the Eastern side of Constantinople. So these 10 horns, which is the last uh, uh, revival of 10 nations, European nations, as I mentioned, probably five from Western Europe, Catholic, or under this religious system which comes from Babylon, and five from Eastern Europe, as I said, probably also with a Catholic background, and therefore they are ridden by the scarlet woman, the mother of harlots. Right, so that's what we see it. That's the one yet to come. This revived Roman Empire by ten dictators and they hand the power over to this leader. Let's call it a, another person. So it's ten nations that hand their power over 
to the beast, that is the, the leader. So in fact, what do we have? We have the leader of the state, which is the beast, and the leader of this religious organization, which is the false prophet. So this religious organization is a church organization which represents yeah, in Revelation 13, the second beast of Revelation 13, but it has a leader, which is the false prophet. And then the first portion of Revelation 13, from verse 1 to verse 10, is the civil beast, which has a leader, a leader, which will be called the beast. This leader will be given its power by these 10 dictators, these 10 nations. They will give the power to this leader. So, all this we saw a moment ago. So I just showed you that graph to, to give you a little bit of understanding of these 10 horns, which are contemporary right at the end, which give their power to the leader of the beast. As we see in verse 13, it says, These are of one mind, these ten leaders, five maybe from Eastern Europe and five from Western Europe, and they will give their power and authority to the beast, to this leader of the beast. All right? And then look at in verse 14. These will make war with the land, so they are contemporary. They are living at the same time. These 10 that give the power to the leader of the beast, these 10 will make war with the Lamb, with Christ at his return, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and King of kings. And those who are with Christ are you and I, called, chosen, and faithful. Now understand, I believe that when Christ comes and we are resurrected, we that are with Christ are not the ones, this is my speculation, we are not the ones that will be fighting the nations because we have not been trained as fighters. Who will fight the nations will be the angelic fighters that will also come with Christ. So as Christ comes, there will be angels and we will be resurrected there. And yes, we'll be with Christ. But a military force will be of Christ. An angelic military force will be of Christ, which is well trained, well equipped to fight the demonic kingdom, the spiritual kingdom. We, in a sense, will be there just looking at those because you and I have been trained for a different role to rule in the world tomorrow and to teach in the world tomorrow as kings and as teachers or lords. That is our training. Our training is not to fight a spiritual war against demons at that time. Yes, indeed, you and I today have to fight Satan and his influences and his vibes and things like that. But the actual spiritual warfare uh, that will happen will be done by, I believe, as I said again, I'm speculating now, by angelic beings with Christ that will know how to uh, handle these demons and, and sort them out. Because we, spiritually speaking, will be, as spirit beings, babes, babes, spiritual babes. So we will just watch this war be uh, exercised 
and these demons being destroyed by a military force well trained. Again, this is my speculation, Reverend. So uh, just putting that into a bit of a picture. But now we get to Revelation 18. Having covered uh, a very in-depth revision of what we covered in weeks previously, and I believe that was important, and I apologize that I reviewed it again, but I believe it was important to put it all together so that the whole jig puzzle fits. And then what do we have, as we saw in Revelation 17, uh, right at the end of uh, Revelation 17, uh, and we covered that uh, the previous sermon, it says here uh, in Revelation uh, uh, Revelation 17, in verse 16, Revelation 17, verse 16, it says, And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, that is those ten nations, uh, five European, uh, Eastern European, five Western European, these ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will hate the harlot. Now this is important. I went through that in the previous study. And make it desolate and naked, eat a flesh and burn her with fire. So we will have civil governments that will come to a point that will destroy this religious Babylonian system. Civil governments which have become so secular they will be tired of this religious system. But they will not destroy the false prophet. But they will destroy this religious system. The false prophet will survive that. As we'll see later on, he will be alive. Uh, he, the false prophet, and the head of the beast, they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. We see that later on. But what do we see? Uh, we come to a point that the nations, civil nations, will destroy this religious system. That is the fall of Babylon, but the religious component. But understand, Babylon had both a religious and a civil component. In the civil component, we have a whole political and financial system. And so after the religious Babylon, which was destroyed by the hands of the beast, Revelation 18 deals with the political strength that's the civilian, civilian side, the political and financial side of Babylon that is also destined to be destroyed at Christ's coming. So that reading now in Revelation 18 verse 1 says, After these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. Now, this is another angel. Now, this is not Christ. It's another angel of the same kind as the angel of Revelation 17, 1. Another angel, but it's not Christ. And it's a very powerful angel. It says here, I saw another angel having great authority given to him by, by God through Christ. He's got great authority. Right, now continue uh, verse 2 and 3. It says, And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of, wrath, of the wrath, of her fornication, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. So, what we have here is, in verse 2 and 3, the complete finality of the system, because it says, is fallen, is fallen. 
So what do we have is a finality of its religious and civil system. So it could, it could mean he's fallen, he's fallen, it's the religious system has fallen, and now the civil system falls. So that could be one possible interpretation of this fallen is fallen. However, I think this latter interpretation is probably more accurate. Again, uh, we don't know uh, exactly why it says is fallen is fallen. One way is say it could be that it's it's final, it's fallen, it's fallen, it's completely fallen. But it could also mean that it fell before the Babylonian system fell before Rome collapsed and now it's falling again. And this system from Babylon is, has collapsed and now is raised up and it's collapsed again and will be utterly destroyed. And then it says, yeah, it has become a dwelling place of all types of demonic activity. And, and that's what we have today in the world, the society, this political system, this financial system is a dwelling place of demonic activity. It's wicked. It's corrupt. It's dirty. And that's why we in the church strongly recommend to brethren not to get involved in the politics of this world. Because why? This is a dwelling place of demonic activity. All these leaders, elected leaders and things like that have, have and are elected through corrupt systems. And therefore avoid that, avoid it completely. Now, continue to read, yeah, and it says, a prison of every foul spirit, that's every wrong attitude, and of every unclean and hated bird. Now, typically, unclean birds are birds of, of, of pride, of prowl that, that go and, and rip things apart, rip things apart. And, and that sort of that sort of people with that attitude that tear the flesh apart and destroy others. It's that sort of uh, uh, spirit. All right, nations have enriched themselves through this political system backed up by a religious system. The religious system has supported many religions. Religious system of this world is basically committing fornication with this evil, uh, corrupt Babylonian system of politics and finances. And so what do we have here is uh, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of the fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, with this uh, religious system. And the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxuries. Uh, nations have enriched themselves through this political system backed up by the religious system. And it's gonna come back even greater, even more, it's gonna resurrect itself. How? Because it says, you're gonna be wonder, how does this come up? How does it come up? Maybe through what people are calling it a great reset. It's like a great revival or of this beast coming out of the bottomless pit. A great reset of capitalism, of so-called building back better. You're going to hear this term pretty frequently, building back better. And uh, it's building back better for themselves, I guess. But that's, that is to me, I stand to be corrected, but uh, to me is this resurrection of this 
out of the bottomless pit of this system that is corrupt. And so he continues in verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Get out of this Babylonian system. For her sins have reached to heaven and God has remembered her iniquities. You, you, you read scriptures like in Jeremiah uh, chapter 50. Uh, Jeremiah 51. Let's just look at them very quickly. Jeremiah chapter 50. Jeremiah chapter 50. Verse 8. Move from the midst of Babylon. Go out of the land of the Chaldeans and be like the rams before the flocks. So it's getting out. Look at... Uh, Chapter 51, verse 6 and 7. Flee from the midst of Babylon, and everyone save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine, therefore the nations are deranged. Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Look at verse 44 and 45. I'll punish Baal in Babylon and I will bring out of his mouth what he has swallowed and the nation shall not stream to him anymore. Yes, the wall of Babylon shall fall. My people Go out of the midst of her, and let everyone deliver himself from the fierce anger of the Lord. So going back to Revelation 18, uh, Revelation 18, verse uh, 4 and 5 says, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in the sins unless you receive of a place. Now, look at the situation when there was the problems in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says, it'll be like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And wherever it is, it is great wickedness and filth and sodomy and ideas today in the world that basically are those of Sodom and Gomorrah. The whole world is going like that. It says, like in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know the story of Lot and Lot's wife? How they had to get out and should not look back? We have to get out and not look back. Also, look here in Revelation 18, verse 5. In Revelation 18, verse 5, says, Her sins have reached to heaven. Right? Revelation uh, 18, verse 5. Um, now, the interesting uh, comment here, uh, in some translations, it puts it, have been heaped up. Uh, and, uh, but the interesting here is, the Greek word is Greek word have reached is Greek word 2853 Koloa, uh, which is glued like cement to bricks. And you look at the story of Genesis 11 of building the Tower of Bible, where they learned how to use cement, and I went through that uh, before. And and these sins have built up like this all the way up to heaven. It says have reached to heaven in similar to the concept of the Tower of Babel and uh, and getting up uh, uh, to uh, all the way up to heaven. So there is an analogy there in a way, uh, symbolically. And then uh, let's read verse 6 through 8. 
render to her just as she rendered to you and repay a double according to her works in the cup which she is mixed, mix double for her. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived lux luxuriously, in the same measure give her torment and sorrow. For she says in her heart, I sit as a queen and I am no widow and will not see sorrow. Therefore, her plagues will come in one day. Death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burnt with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. And so what we have here is retribution. Her power does not compare with God's power. The power of this, uh, let's call it, uh, system, political and financial system of the beast and of these ten kings is not going to be compared with God's power. It's just not going to be compared. And they will be retributed. They will be punished. And look in verse 8 says, in one day. In one day. Now, if you look with me to Daniel 5, Daniel 5, let's go to Daniel 5. You know, remember the story of many, many Tekel Farsa. Let's go into Daniel 5. Daniel 5, which is the destruction of uh, Babylon. And uh, that writing appeared on the, on the wall during the feast of Belshazzar. In Daniel 5, verse 1 through 5, it talks about they were having this feast. And, uh, and then there were fingers that wrote on the wall. Right? And then we read uh, in verse 10 and 11 that the queen remembered Daniel. Because remember, this is like the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel had not over a period of time, they, they kind of pushed him to the side. But then the grandmother remember, hey, remember, there's Daniel. He knows how to read these things. So call him. Because she says, the, verse 11, there is a man in your kingdom, in whom is the spirit of the Holy God. And in the days of your father, should be grandfather, uh, more correctly uh, translated, uh, the, the word is more ancestor. Uh, light uh, in the, the days of a grandfather, light and understanding and wisdom. Uh, he, he had that, uh, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father or grandfather, uh, the, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. So, yeah, is this Daniel is brought in? And then a little bit later in verse uh, 25 through 30, then uh, Daniel says, this is the inscription, many, many take a little farce in verse 25. And then he says, many, God has numbered your kingdom. Tekel, you have been weighed and found wanting and perished. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. And you can see that it fell that same night. Look at verse 30. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. So we have Babylon of old was destroyed in one day. And yeah, this repeated, let's call it, destruction of Babylon. See, that's why it says it's fallen, it's fallen. I think that's probably a more a better interpretation of Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Now, the, the, this later revival of Babylon is fallen again. It completely destroyed in one day. Now, let's continue reading Revelation 18, verse 9 and 10. And it says, The kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, standing at a distance for fear of a torment, saying, Alas, Alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. 
So now in first place, we have a lament of the earth's rulers. Now, we have seen in Revelation 17 that the earth's rulers turned against the religious side of Babylon. Now, the financial and political side is being destroyed and the merchants are lamenting. Now, remember, there was no lament when the religious system, which is the woman, the harlot, was destroyed in Revelation 17. There was no lament. But now, for the destruction of the political financial system, they say, Alice, Alice, oh no, oh no. So, what, when will this destruction will be? Will be during the day of the Lord. Because this is the latter part of the day of the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 13. You see how different scriptures in Old Testament come to light. Isaiah chapter 13. We're going to read verse 6 first. It says, Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with both wrath and fierce anger. And he will destroy its sinners from it. Look at verse 9 through 11. Uh, I beg your pardon, I, I should have read uh, verse 6. Wail for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Uh, verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations will not give their light. So that's at the beginning of the day of the Lord. That's the heavenly signs. We went through that. And then verse 11. I'll punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I'll lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. So this day of the Lord, yes, indeed, is one year. But this final destruction is that last day when Christ comes and it's all destroyed in one day. Look at verse 19. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, like destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited, nor will it be settled from generation to generation, nor will the Arabian pitch tents there, nor will the shepherds make their shepherds there, but wild beasts of the desert will lie there, and their houses will be full of owls, ostriches will dwell there, and wild goats will caper there. So we can see this is a destruction it will be during the day of the Lord. As I also read, in uh, verse 11, this says, And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no, no one buys or uh, uh, their merchandise anymore. So yeah, we have no one buys their merchandise anymore. So yeah, we have uh, this point of anymore. Uh, not anymore. The economic characteristics of this Babylonian system is now clearly indicated. In verse 12 to verse 13, look. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon and incense, a frank, a fragrant oil and frankincense, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and bodies and souls of men. So there is this Babylonian system full of luxury, wealth, abundance of food, and slavery, very probably the sexual trade, human trade of sexual people, uh, for, for, for sexual purposes, man and woman. And then it says in verse 14, the fruit of your soul longed for has gone from you. It was the desire, the covetousness of things have gone from you. And all the things that are rich and splendid have gone from you. And you shall find them no more at all. Uh, so uh, we see our no more, but we also saw a little earlier where is it? It says not anymore. Um, let me just 
just see. Anyway, uh, one hour the merchandise over there went by, uh, every kind. Anyway, I read it just now, but there's the word anymore, not anymore. So anymore, not anymore, happens quite a few times. And also no more at all. Uh, and uh, then we continue uh, in, uh, in verse 15 and verse through verse 19. It says, the merchants of these things uh, who become rich for her will stand at a distance for fear of atonement, weeping and wailing. So the merchants, the businessmen, the, the, these global uh, people, the, these very rich, wealthy, international uh, businessmen, they will say, Alice, Alice, that great city, that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. In one hour, came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who will travel, all who travel by ship, sailors, and as many as trade on the seas to the distance, and cried out when they saw the smoke of a burning. What is like this great city? <coughs> Bigger part. Verse 19, they threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alice, Alice, that great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. It shows the destruction being very, very quick. Very quick. And then look at it in verse 20. It's an encouragement to us. It's an encouragement to us. It says, Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you, holy apostles and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. Now, some Bible versions have it as uh, holy, uh, and then uh, comma, apostles, or saints, uh, comma, apostles, and prophets. So it could well, the reading could well be uh, saints, because, you know, a holy means set aside, saints means set aside. So it's, it's, it's basically the same word. In fact, the word saint and the word holy is the same word in Portuguese as a matter of interest. So it's basically the same word. And, uh, and so it could be referring uh, could, uh, there could be a reading that says saints, in other words, God's people, apostles, and prophets. So it could very well be an encouragement uh, to say rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints, in other words, you, God's people, apostles, and prophets, for God has avenged you on her. So it's an encouragement to us to say this is going to happen. All right, now uh, let's read verse 21 through 24. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence the great city, Babylon, will be thrown down and shall not be found anymore. So Yah is an example that, that he's just using an example of a great millstone and throwing it into the sea, giving it as an example of great violence that the great city, Babylon, will be thrown down destroyed and will be found and will not be found anymore. And the sound of hoppers, musicians, flutes, trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. No craftsman of any craft should be found in you anymore. And the sound of the millstone shall not be heard in you anymore. And the light of a lamp shall not be shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth. Uh, for by your sorcery all the nations were deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and of all were slain on earth. So here we have a situation that there is a complete and permanent destruction. We saw how this uh, great millstone 
is thrown into the sea as an example how the great city Babylon is going to be destroyed. It, you can compare that to the situation of Daniel 2, verse 34 and 35, where there's a stone which was not cut by human hands, which was symbolic of Christ, was came down and hit the, the feet and the legs of this image and utterly destroyed the whole image. The whole Babylon is fallen, is fallen. So we can see a complete and permanent destruction of Babylon. Uh, also, we saw the word not anymore uh, a number of times, uh, uh, seven times, and also uh, no more at all once as well. So uh, it's a complete destruction. Seven is complete. So this religious system covered in the previous study in Revelation 17, and this political system, political and financial system now covered in Revelation 18, which has unified the world into a global market, into a global society, into a global ideology, because wherever you go around the world, there's the same vibe, the same spirit, the same ideology, and obviously modern technology helps in that. All the system will be utterly destroyed. Brethren, this is great news for us because we know that the world tomorrow will be very different, very different. Well, thank you, brethren. That concludes tonight's study.